Thanks for coming today. I'm going to be moderating today's webinar uh, with a little help from my friend Grace Simpkins. Um, this series is sponsored by NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network, where I work, which is spread across the country and helps connect people to all that NOAA does. Our amazing partner, Woods Hole Sea Grant, is located at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution here on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. To find out about future webinars, you can go to their education tab on their webpage or simply follow them on Facebook. This is the eighth webinar in a series designed to help to get you know NOAA and some of our incredible experts during this, these weeks of school closures. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Today, we're introducing you to Commander Jason Mansour, an active duty officer in the United States NOAA Corps. He's going to talk to you about his job and his experience as a pilot for NOAA. A few guidelines before I introduce Jason. You're all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and want to make sure that everyone can hear our speaker. However, there is a box where you can ask questions. Some of you have signed in already to let us know where you're calling in from, and we appreciate that. We encourage you to ask questions as we go, and we'll be keeping track for Jason. We know that we won't be able to get to all the questions. We expect a thousand participants on today's webinar, but we will stop periodically and answer them. Don't be intimidated, Jason. You're going to be fine. Uh, depending on your device, how you access the question box might be different. So for some of you, it might be a question mark on the bottom or side of your screen. Others might have a little box with an arrow and a hand. And if you click on the arrow, you can show the question box. So before we get started, Grace, why don't you let us know where folks are dialing in from today? Yeah, thank you, Nicole. So we have quite the list that I've been putting together. So I just want to share, there are folks on here from Barbados, from Antigua, North Carolina, Atlanta, Brunswick, and Savannah, Georgia, from Grand Cayman and Trinidad, and Toronto, Canada, Long Island, New York, Sarasota, Tampa, Spring Hill, Bradenton, Panama City, Florida, New Jersey, Michigan, West Virginia, Tennessee, Maine, Alabama, Washington State, Massachusetts, California, Mississippi, Ohio, South Carolina, Maryland, variety places in Texas, and a, a special shout out to the person from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, because that's where I was, that's where I'm from. Um, so we have people from all over. If I didn't say where you're from, please excuse me, but oh, in Hawaii, I see it just is continuing to come in. Very exciting where everyone is from. Um, Yep, so there you go. Thanks. Nicole, you are muted right now, so people cannot hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Thanks, Grace. Um, I just wanted to say my hometown of Pittsburgh just weighed in. So hello, Vicki. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to you, Jason. Outstanding. Well, team, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Commander Jason Mansour with the United States NOAA Corps. Uh, on behalf of Rear Admiral Michael Sila and Commander Chris Sloan, I want to thank you for joining us, all thousand of you across the world, for this NOAA Live seminar. Um, I have a very special job today. My job is to share with you the critical work that NOAA does as an agency, that the NOAA Aircraft Operations, and indeed, the Office of Marine and Aviation Operations does every single day on behalf of NOAA and the awesome things that we do hunting hurricanes every single year. So glad to have you on board. And um, I want to reiterate, please keep the questions coming um, via the chat box. Um, like uh, the moderator said, Nicole, uh, we, we can't get to all of them, but we're going to try. And this is meant to be as interactive as possible. So here we go. We mentioned NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and I am going to pause the webinar right now and uh, stop sharing my slide for a second and ask the audience, what do you think NOAA does? What we are getting in here. Um, there's a little bit of delay because we have a lot of people on. Some folks are saying weather. Hunts okay, for hurricanes, hurricanes, investigates hurricanes, tracks hurricanes, they study the sea, um, monitor storms, uh, oceans, tsunamis, 
lots of awesome. lots of good answers. Awesome. Those are fantastic answers. Um, taking a step back, and I would say, by the way, you're all right. NOAA, in my opinion, is the best science agency in the United States. And I used a big word, science, right? Like, oh my gosh. So I agree with you that NOAA really studies planet Earth, definitely involves the sky, definitely involves the ocean. Let's take a step back and ask the question, what does science mean to you? All right, let's see. Okay, so hi, Emily in Texas. That's, they say, science, big brain, chemistry, the study of all things, homework. <laughs> <laughs> Science means fun, gadgets and gizmos, research, learning awesome. things, discovering awesome. things. Okay. Those are excellent, excellent answers. Um, let me think about this. Science to me is like basically asking a question and finding out the answer, right? Just that's, to me, it's that simple. And it can go across the board. Now you're right. In the context of someone said, oh, Noah studies the ocean, right? The question would be, hey, I'm going to go fishing today. I wonder when high and low tides are, right? That's a good question to ask. Noah finds out the answer about the studying the sky, right? I wonder, will it rain on my bike ride today or when I go for a walk? That's a good question. Noah will help find the answer for a forecast. So. And those are just two very, very brief um, uh, segments of the broad portfolio that NOAA has. NOAA specializes in a portfolio from the surface of the sun to the depths of the ocean and everything in between. So NOAA has a broad swath of specialty that is working hard every single day to understand and predict. Now, NOAA is made up of six different boxes, if you will. And that would include the National Weather Service, like someone mentioned, yes. The National Ocean Service, yes. NOAA Research, Satellites, Fisheries, Ocean Service, if I said that already, I apologize. And the one that um, I'm uh, active duty within called the NOAA Corps is called the Office of Marine and Aviation Operations. This box is the operational experts of NOAA and indeed the Department of Commerce that is what NOAA falls under. So OMAO has 15 research ships and nine aircraft. And our job as NOAA Corps officers and exceptional team members that include contractors, wage mariners, government employees, we operate those ships and the aircraft to get science done. That involves oftentimes operating far away from friends and family to obtain the data that no one needs to make better determinations on a number of very, very important issues. I'll pause right there and I'll give you a, another question. So right now there are eight active duty services of the United States. Could anyone take a stab at naming all eight? Whoa, okay, Big that's ask. typing. Big ask. All right, well, maybe we can get them all from a number of group of people. So we've Absolutely. got, um, so Sydney says the Army. Army's good. Um, sorry, they're coming in really fast. So let me see, Michael says Navy. Navy, good. Um, well, let's see, somebody, uh, Lacey says Marine Corps. Marine Corps, Three. Yeah. Um, Heather uh, dropped in a couple that we've already named and also added the Air Force. Four. Okay, and then we've got, oh, Jamie came up with the Coast Guard. Five. Okay, uh -huh. we, got three we, more have, to go. we do have a few people that have named all those five. Let me see if I see any new ones. Um, somebody said NASA. That uh, a, good, a good answer, but NASA is not a active duty uniform service. So, so far I've heard the five of the six armed forces. The sixth one is a brand new one. That's a hint. Space Force? Boom, there you go, excellent. So there are six 
Armed Forces of the United States. Excellent job. Space Force also, by Andrew, by the way. I just wanted to add that in. Okay, thank awesome. you. <laughs> and there are also two other active duty services, but not armed. One of them, my name tag over there, it says NOAA Corps, absolutely. And there's one more out there. Hmm. Okay. Um, I am, I'm not seeing it yet. Let me see if anybody, I hear, wait, Peace Corps? Good Somebody guess, asked? close. Um, I have Commissioned Corps from Ellie. Um, Public Health Service by Maria. Exactly right, very good, the Public Health Service. So the eight active duty uniform services of the United States, Navy, Army, Air Force, Marine, Coast Guard, Space Force, armed, and now you have the United States Public Health Service and the United States NOAA Corps. The NOAA Corps is among the very smallest. You can compare other services can have up to tens of thousands of service members. NOAA Corps only has 321. Of the 321, only about 40 are pilots like myself. So we are the smallest uniform service. I think that was true up until recently. I think right now the Space Force may be the very smallest, but far and away the NOAA Corps is a very, very small uniform service. All eight are active duty, which means we are going to um, serve our country to the best of our capability, but only six are armed, okay? So that's an important distinction there. I did mention that NOAA has 15 ships and nine aircraft, and I'll share with you, a, um, I'll tell you what, before I share with you the ships, I wanna share with you um, a little bit of my background of how I got into the United States NOAA Corps. Um, I hope you can see my mouse right now. Nicole, can you see my mouse moving around? Yep, we can see it. Awesome, okay. So I went to school at California State University, Monterey Bay in California. When I graduated, I had a degree in Earth Systems Science Policy, and that's, that's a broad-based a science degree, but I knew I loved the ocean. I knew I wanted to serve my country and I knew I wanted to fly. And the NOAA Corps is a beautiful fit of all of my, my personal passions. The picture in the upper corner here, this is at my best friend's graduation way back in 2004 is when he graduated. I joined in 2003, I'm really old, okay? And the deal was, Noble Corps said, Jason, good to have you aboard. You are going to a NOAA ship, guaranteed. We hear you want to fly. That sounds nice. Might work out, but we need you to, uh, to go to sea first. And I says, okay. So my first sea tour was on the NOAA ship Miller Freeman. And this is a picture of uh, our mission was fishery research. So we were out there in the Bering Sea. Who has seen um, uh, the TV show Deadliest Catch, where they're catching crabs, right? We were out there too in that crazy weather, but our job was to catch pollock. So a quick question. I said the word pollock. Who likes fish sticks and fish witch and sushi? Me. Everyone says, we're getting a lot of me's. Awesome. awesome, okay. <laughs> then you should care about pollock because pollock is one of um, the biggest fisheries in the United States. And it's so important that NOAA is responsible for going out there in the ocean and determining and estimating how much fish, specifically pollock in this case, are left, how many can we take, but not take so much that there won't be any left in the future. So sustainability, okay? That was our mission. So I went to sea for two years, uh, had an absolute blast. I wouldn't trade it for the world. And I went to flight school in 2006 and I got my wings. And how NOAA uh, Aviation works is they start you on smaller aircraft and build you up to bigger aircraft. 
if that is what the Noble Corps needs you to do. So I started flying, I'll get into this in my presentation, the DHC-6 Twin Otter, the Havilland Twin Otter, and we were flying um, all over the country for a various number of missions, I'll, I'll get into shortly, and I upgraded to the NOAA Gulfstream 4 in 2012, doing the hurricane hunting mission. Um, I have been extremely fortunate in my career. It has been a phenomenal adventure, and I would do it again in a heartbeat with absolutely no regrets. So it's been a, a fantastic ride. This is a slide I was thinking of. This is a picture of some of the NOAA Pacific Fleet in Newport, Oregon on the West Coast. I mentioned NOAA has 15 uh, research vessels. They fall into three different categories. I just shared with you one, fishery research, okay? Uh, in my case, we were studying pollock or making sure a fishery was being sustainably uh, harvested. The other box is oceanographic. That means going out across the world in some cases and making sure there is a historical record of the ocean water. Could include oxygen content, could include temperature, uh, how salty the water is, right? Making sure that we understand what's happening with the ocean. The last box is called hydrographic. That means these ships go out there and actually map the sea floor with sound waves. And that's super important because every single day, guess what? You have, well, you know what? I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to ask you that question. I'll pause it. Why do you think it's important for NOAA to provide really good called nautical charts to captains of, of ships? Why would that be a good idea? All right. Let's see what we got here. So they don't crash, says Braden. That's really good. To know where stuff is, to mm -hmm. be able to navigate. Um, oh my gosh there are so many answers coming in hot and awesome. furious here for fishing somebody says um so they can stay safe um so yeah Perfect. okay I, I like that answer um staying safe uh, resonates with me really well so if you have a chart that is old right and you are the captain of, of a ship and by the way this could include a recreational fisherman a commercial ship a tanker a cruise ship, a military vessel, right? They all can use NOAA charts. If you're coming into a port, you need to know, hey, there are rocks here, here, and here. You can navigate around those hazards to stay safe, to know where things are, right? What's really important about this particular mission is after a natural disaster, for example, a hurricane, right? Hurricane may mess up a, a harbor like this and you may have new hazards that weren't there before the hurricane right some things could have sunk some rocks could have moved and that can cause new threats to ships and NOAA is there updating that seafloor and those nautical charts to make sure everyone is as safe as possible outstanding um, I'll pause there for a second any questions about the uh, the NOAA fleet and those three different categories I mentioned Let's see, there there are, um, well, we have sort of questions. Um, one person asks, are there any lady pilots in NOAA? Absolutely. Yeah, so we know that that's the case. Um, there are a couple questions specific to your work in hurricanes. I think they're anticipating what you're getting into, but okay. uh, Jeremiah would like to know whether learning to fly was hard. Learning to fly, was hard, but it's also a lot of fun because um, in flight school, you understand that the aircraft is in three different axes, right? You have the Y axis, vertical up and down, the X axis, it's left and right, then the Z axis, like side to side. And so learning to fly and stay safe um, is, it's a fantastic privilege because in aviation, things are happening so fast and you have to understand what's happening around the aircraft and uh, where you want to land, where you want to take off from, weather is a big part of that. So flight school is hard, but it's hard because you need to know how to operate your aircraft safely. And by the way, every aircraft is different. So flight school 
it was challenging, yes, but not impossible by any means. Great, thank you. And can I ask one more question about the NOAA Corps? Yes, please. Uh, Nan, Nan would like to know how many years do you have to go to school in all to go to the NOAA Corps because uh, she would really like to do that. Outstanding. Well, um, if you want to join NOAA Corps, we want to hear from you by all means. Right now, the requirement is for a four-year bachelor degree in a um, in a field that basically NOAA can put to immediate use. So what you can do to make yourself more attractive to NOAA and NOAA Corps would be to say, hey, I have a degree in oceanography, for example, in meteorology, in GPS, GIS, in watershed management. So if you have a science degree and you know that NOAA has a mission doing what your educational background is in, we definitely want to hear from you. But for the exact NOAA Corps eligibility requirements, there is a website. You can Google or uh, use your favorite search engine, um, NOAA Corps eligibility, and it should populate with the website that will tell you more information. Great, thank you. Outstanding. Good questions, y'all. Okay, we talked about the ships. And now we're going to go to aircraft. Right now, NOAA has nine aircraft. They're all based in Lakeland, Florida. That's like about an hour south of Orlando, so the middle of the state. This is a picture of our hangar, and you can see that we have a beautiful paint job that every NOAA aircraft has. So if you ever see this paint job on an aircraft, either at an airport near you or flying in the sky, guaranteed to be a NOAA aircraft. And NOAA has six smaller aircraft, like these uh, de Havilland Twin Otter right here, and also the King Air here. And we have three heavy Hurricane Hunter aircraft. Two of our P3s are right here. And the Gulfstream 4 that I fly isn't shown, but we'll definitely talk about it. So I said the word aircraft, and I want to make sure that we are on the same page. I'll keep this slide up um, so you can watch me. Uh, move along. I want to make sure that we know what the different parts of an aircraft is. So if I were to show you these black things right here, what are these black things on an aircraft? What are they called? Black things on the aircraft. Let me scroll down here. Landing gear, wheels. Beautiful. Exactly right. You know, got, got baseline the uh, the questions. Very good. Those are the wheels of the aircraft. Excellent. What is this thing right here? All right. Let's see who gets the first answer here. Um, sorry, it's just a little delay here. Oh, uh, Lee, Ross, they all say the wing. Excellent. That's correct. Wing. And wing is important because that creates a lift that keeps the aircraft in the air. Outstanding. What is this thing back here? Um, let's see, tail, tail fin. Very good, outstanding. So far, you, you, everyone's crushing it, very good. And this part, just forward to the wing right here, and this aircraft has two of them, by the way. Uh, propeller. Yes. Uh, everyone, yep. Propellers and engines, very good. So propellers and engines, guess what? They move the aircraft forward, which ensures airflow goes over the wing, which creates lift so you can fly. And the tail back here has something back here called the elevator that helps your crops go up and down. This part of the tail right here, the rudder, that goes like this on the z-axis, the rudder side to side. And back here on the wing, that's the aileron that helps tilt the aircraft to left and right. Just want to make sure we knew what the different parts of the aircraft are. Now this aircraft looks familiar to you. I, uh, I had a friend of mine, Allison Henry, of the Northeast Fisheries Science Center do a presentation recently. And when I first started flying the aircraft with her and her team, we were flying for a number of missions. It would be looking at marine mammals or whales. It could be looking at polar bears in the Arctic, looking at dolphins in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, sea turtles in, in, in Mexico. Uh, so we go all over uh, with these four twin otters um, doing scientific missions for NOAA. So I want everyone to put on their thinking caps and I'll show you a few pictures I need your help with determining what exactly are we looking at. 
So the first one, I gave you a hint, it was uh, previewed by Allison Henry recently at the last, or a few um, webinars ago. What am I looking at here? All right, let's see. Just give me a pause here to get the answers coming in. Um, okay. Some people say blue whale. Kyle thinks it might be a humpback. Very good. Uh, I would say whale is correct. It is a whale. Okay. Not a blue or humpback. All right. Let's see. If it's not a blue or a humpback, what do you guys think? Someone says gray whale. Someone says sperm whale. Oh, Katie. I think she got it right. Katie says it's a right whale. Katie, you are correct. Congratulations. That is a North Atlantic right whale they are endangered so what the twin otter does and the pilots and crew we fly along at about a thousand feet and a hundred knots 100 miles an hour and we have cameras we take pictures of these whales and each of these whales are different because they have you can see the fins here and the tail and the fluke and these barnacles and the blow hole right there and, and the blow so every whale has a different pattern of barnacles so we know exactly, oh, for example, this is uh, the whale called Blueberry and her baby calf. So these are the kind of pictures that we can take from these, these aircraft. Someone said humpback whale, and would you agree or disagree that this picture right here is a humpback? I agree. Everybody oh, said, yeah. yeah. Very good. So that is in fact a humpback whale, very good. You can specialize and see those white pectoral fins, very good. Next, what am I looking at here? Okay, let's see, walruses, everybody very said. Very good, these are walruses, you're right. Those kind of white tusks, very good. Walruses, they're staying very close together. It looks very cold up there in Alaska, I believe this was taken. And here's an extra challenging one. What in the world are these animals? Hmm, let's see. Nora says dolphins. Oh, Cheryl says beluga. Very good. Cheryl, you are correct. Those are beluga whales, outstanding. The adults are white, and the relatively newer borns, or the younger ones, are gray. Uh, when we were flying these surveys in Alaska, uh, I would call uh, this picture it's like marshmallows and chocolate milk because the water around the belugas, look how dark and murky it is, kind of like chocolate milk, right? And these belugas pop out like marshmallows. So it made them pretty easy to spot. Very good. Okay, last picture, then we'll talk about the, the hurricane hunting stuff. Here we go. This particular picture, we were looking for seals and sea lions. And how many are you all seeing in this picture? Okay, let's see. I love this picture, by the way. Um, oh, wow, three. Everybody says three. Very good, that's correct. Outstanding, they are there and there and there. Very good, but you can see it can be challenging sometimes on these missions to take pictures of these animals and really understanding where they are um, all over the country, making sure that we have accurate counts of their populations. So. Mm -hmm. Very good, we will secure from those pictures. Um, any questions so far about the smaller aircraft and, and the twin otter and flying for marine mammals? I'll pause the uh, screen for a second. Um, we, let me, let me just go to the top of my queue here. Um, we are getting a lot of questions about, well, somebody was saying how beautiful the planes are. Those paint jobs look pretty impressive. Thank you, um, I will. Uh, I'll amplify that and say that, uh, in my opinion, we have the best maintenance team in the world. And I believe that because you noticed on on the uh, how good the aircraft are looking, right? That is directly reflective of the exceptional employees and mechanics that we have in the squadron. So um, I have no doubt. I I know that the the maintenance personnel that we have, they take personal pride in the aircraft. If they wouldn't put themselves or their families on board, we're not flying that day. So we have the best mechanics bar none. So thank you for noticing, I appreciate that. All right, I think um, another question, well, Brad would like to know if you have a, your boat license. Can gotcha, you know? my captain's license, I do not. If I'm being truly vulnerable, I got seasick every single day <laughs> during my sea tour, no exaggeration, every day. So I, uh, I am a surfer, 
Um, I get seasick, so I uh, no captain license for me. I do have a, a, a license to fly, absolutely, but not so much on the boat side. All right, Although good. I love my maritime brothers and sisters. All right, the rest of these are all related to hurricanes, so I'm gonna let you go a little bit further and see if we can't answer a few of them. Outstanding. Okay, here we go, y'all. So the picture of the aircraft in front of you is called our WP3 Orion aircraft. NOAA has two of these. And I tell uh, the public at air shows and, and schools and whatnot, if I were to, to liken this P3 to an animal, I would tell you it's like a rhinoceros, okay? It, it's big, it's tough, it's heavy, it's slow. Its job is to fight its way through a hurricane eye wall at or below 10,000 feet multiple times over a mission. As it goes through the hurricane, it goes into the center of the eye of the hurricane. It's very calm in there. Ah. And they mark the exact center of the hurricane, the bullseye, dropping sensors along the way. We'll talk about that in a little bit. In stark contrast, the jet that I am one of the commanders of, this is the NOAA Gulfstream 4 or G4 for short. I would tell you this aircraft is like a cheetah. It's lean and sleek. So we fly much higher, much faster than the P3. We fly at 45,000 feet. That's nine miles high. And we cover seven miles every minute. So we get gone quick. But we are not designed to take the turbulence the P3 can. So instead of flying through the hurricane on the Gulf Stream 4, we fly over or around the storm, dropping those sensors along the way, like I said. Okay, are we good there on those two, two nuances, two differences? Okay. I, um, Nicole, I will pause here real quick, and I would ask you uh, two questions. Number one would be, could I use, a, a, I'd like a virtual volunteer, please. Uh, if someone could just provide me your, your first name, please. Uh, they'd like to volunteer for this presentation. Sorry. All right. Okay, hold on, let me get to the... There are so many um, responses in the question box. It's taking me a while to get to the new ones. So hold <laughs> on one second. Uh, okay. Oh, Grace, I can't get to the bottom of my question box. Can you pick somebody for me, Grace? So I'm going to uh, do Jake. Okay. Jake. Jake. Hold on one second, Jason. I'm having trouble hearing you. Grace, can you hear me? I hear you, but I cannot hear Jason. Okay. Can you please mute your audio and let me see if I can get Jason back here? Jason, I'm having trouble hearing you, Jason. Can you, let me just. If you can hear Jason, um, can you please let me know in the message box? I want to make sure it's not just a problem on my end, but I've lost audio here, Grace. I too have lost audio with Jason, so I'm going to try. Oh, I hear you. Can you hear me? Now I've got it. We've, we've got and now we're getting back. So, Jason, we lost your audio. Okay. All right. So Grace is going to mute. I'm going to mute. I think I have you back. Can you just start off with Jake? <laughs> that's. I think that's where we left off. Awesome. Start off with. I apologize, team, for the for the uh, connection. I apologize. Start off with what again, Nicole? 
Grace had selected Jake as your volunteer. And if you could just pick up from there, that would be great. Sure. Team, I apologize. Jake, thank you for volunteering. I do appreciate that. So to my presentation, Jake, let's say the hurricane Jake just formed in the Atlantic Ocean. Okay. Looks to be probably a category five, just saying. Why do you think it would be important for NOAA to put our crews and the aircraft in harm's way to study Hurricane Jake? Any thoughts on that? Okay, Jason, I am looking for Jake's response, but I'm having trouble getting down the, the uh, box. I think we have an overflow of responses here. Um, okay. Hey, Grace, can you, without uh, changing your audio, can you um, put the response, just text it to me so I can share the response with the audience? Because I am not able to access it. No problem. If it's, if it's causing hassle, I'm happy to, to go on. I'm, I just want to engage the audience, you know? No, I think that's a great idea. I think um, we're just having connection issues somewhere in this thread. <laughs> um, so Hurricane Jake, and let me see. I'm just gonna put um, gonna put myself up here again so people so I'm not just some uh, voice in the ether here. Um, so Jake says to warn folks to prepare. Exactly right. To warn, to warn folks to prepare. Excellent, Jake. And the reason why we have to warn people to prepare is because when you, Hurricane Jake, formed in the Atlantic Ocean, there's not a lot of stuff out there in the ocean for NOAA to work with, for the computer models to work with. So when you formed, the NOAA computer models got together. And they went, come here, come here, put our heads together, We're thinking caps on, okay? Where do we think? Hurricane Jake's going to go. They look around, they check their resources, and they go, Jake's going to go that way. And that initial forecast might not be very good because the models don't have a lot of information to work with. By, I'll put the screen back on. By going out there into harm's way, into the hurricane environment, NOAA provides the real-time data called in situ observations. That's the real-time data the hurricane models need to get a good forecast. The more times we fly, the more data we get, the better the forecast is both on hurricane forecasted track and the forecast intensity of the hurricane. We good? I'll just simulate yes. <laughs> Excellent job. Okay. I mentioned that uh, we fly at 45,000 feet in the Gulf Stream 4. Who thinks, if I'm flying along, I'll look out the cockpit window, this is what I see from 45,000 feet. Do we think that's true? That I see that when, when I'm doing my mission? Or we don't think that's true? How about we make that a rhetorical question? <laughs> <laughs> Your chat blows up. Uh, okay. the, the answer is uh, no. This is a beautiful picture from the space station. This is not the view from the aircraft. This is the picture from the aircraft. You might be surprised to see that there's not a whole lot going on out the front windows. I can't see a whole lot, okay? So we fly for eight hours at a time. Um, and for six of those hours, sometimes more, we don't see a whole lot. That's because with a hurricane, all that warm, moist air that is the hurricane engine, the core, it rises, cools, and condenses. It makes us kind of like miss this fog, even at 45,000 feet. So for majority of the flight, we're using the cockpit and the flight deck references, the radars, to stay safe and to navigate safely around the hurricane and into the hurricane environment. Now, for those extra good NOAA observers, you may see a dash ornament in this area here. This is our unofficial, official, unofficial turbulence indicator. When this thing wiggles, I put on the fasten seatbelt sign. Bing bong. True story. Okay. Um, I don't want to blow up the chat window again. So another rhetorical question. 
is it possible for us to land the aircraft safely even if we can't see the runway to the last few seconds? The answer is yes. I'm gonna show you a very quick glimpse of what uh, that landing would be like. This movie, I'll pause it right here. This uh, simulator is our training in a flight simulator. Um, and we train for the worst case scenarios. We train for there's an engine fire, the engine isn't working, there's a lot of fog, there's icing, um, your crew member is sick. So we train for a lot of really, really bad days to make sure we can always get our crew and the aircraft back safely. So here's a picture, or here's a quick movie, and you'll see these lines where the, where the runway should come into view shortly. So here we go. And there's the runway. And touchdown. Very good. So, yes, we can definitely land the aircraft, even if uh, it gets that foggy, um, coming back after a long mission. But it's a great aircraft, very advanced aircraft, and it keeps us safe. Questions so far? Um, so uh, I think a few people are catching that movie on delay based on their individual connectivity. Um, but uh, we do have a couple of questions. Somebody, um, Rylan asks, um, what is the personnel on your plane? So mm -hmm. how many people are in there with you? Right. So if we're on a, a full complement, we'll have up to 10 people on board uh, the Gulfstream 4. Um, it'll be uh, myself as aircraft commander, up to two of co-pilots and a crew of six. And then also we may have a, a, another seat on board for um, uh, a distinguished guests or, or uh, uh, distinguished visitors. So 10 is the answer on the Gulfstream 4. And um, Candace wants to know, what does it feel like going through the hurricane? The hur so every hurricane is, is different. The, the, the tropical storm or the hurricanes that we fly, keep in mind that they're very much alive. So over the course of eight hours, uh, the hurricane could be getting stronger, could be getting weaker. Um, you know, people may think, oh, if we're going to go out and fly a Category 5 hurricane, it's got to be really, really gnarly, really, really bumpy. And that isn't always the case. Um, oftentimes, you can have a Category 1 storm. You're thinking, oh, a Category 1, no big deal. But guess what? That Category 1 is hungry. It, it, it's intensifying. It's over warm water. It's getting stronger. All right, those storms can give you a lot more turbulence than even a Category 5 can. So um, the answer to your question is it, it varies. It's definitely bumpy for sure, um, but we operate safely uh, to make sure we don't break the aircraft by any means. Great. Um, that's a great uh, response. Also, let's see. So every a couple of people are concerned they think it would be pretty dangerous for you to fly into these storms and they're curious about how you stay safe absolutely um not only for myself uh definitely the crew on board for sure um we i'll, I'll use a broad statement we do not think we're invincible it is dangerous doing this mission we train and we prepare for every flight very very methodically and for a, the instance of a mission, it's called an operational risk mitigation. So we sit down as a crew and we review, okay, in this mission, this is how we're gonna do um, this mission of flying into the hurricane. So we'll be going up to 45,000 feet, flying seven miles a minute. Let's think about all the things that could go wrong on this mission. Okay, to the best of our ability and our experience. Okay, this is with the whole crew, okay. Now that we know the things that we think could go wrong, how bad is it if they go wrong? And what can we do to help ensure to the maximum extent that we can that that doesn't happen, okay? And then we look at that entire list and we present it to our commanding officer for review. And he or she will say, yes, you've done a great job reviewing the risks. I like what you're doing to, to minimize those risks to the crew and the aircraft. You can proceed with this mission. So we are extremely methodical in our preparation and execution of these missions, but it is inherently dangerous, absolutely. Great, thank you. Um, what do you do if 
Um, well, actually, let me let me back that up because you kind of addressed that on that last question. Um, can you talk about which hurricane missions you've flown? Because some people know the names of these hurricanes, so maybe um, can you share some of them? Oh my gosh! Uh, so, been flying since 2012. Um, there have been I don't want to be lame and say a lot of hurricanes, but a lot come to mind. The first one that pops into my head was Hurricane Sandy that was going up the, the eastern seaboard. I was born in the Bronx, New York. Um, it's it's challenging for, for us because as we're flying the missions, right, like we never want a hurricane to impact anyone, obviously. Um, when they do impact people or they're about to impact people, the environment on the aircraft changes very perceptibly. In the case of Hurricane Sandy, when the hurricane was way out there in the Atlantic Ocean, right, over the course of an eight-hour flight, you know, there's some usual chatter in the in the cabin, in the cockpit. You, you're talking about things. Um, but as a hurricane started to approach land, right, for about eight hours, it was all almost silent in the cockpit. Everyone was absolutely intent on getting the best information for the best models to keep people informed. So Hurricane Sandy, uh, to me, uh, that, that, that shift um, and that really, really focus on, hey, people are about to be or are being impacted right now, right? This is our job. Let's try and keep them as informed as possible. That comes to mind right away. Uh, great, thank you. Um, a couple more questions, just quickly. Um, what's, Claire would like to know, what's the maximum height you can fly at? Claire, excellent. Uh, in the case of the Gulf Stream 4, the maximum air, uh, the maximum altitude that is certified for is 45,000 feet. And Commander, I have to tell you, a lot of people want to know if you've ever crashed. Uh, no, I've never crashed. <laughs> like that's, personally speaking, that's that's my job, right? Like don't crash, <laughs> right? Um, I got a, a good tip from um, a, a wingman of mine and that he actually writes on his wrist the number of people on board the aircraft, every single mission. And that, air, and that number reminds him or her, hey, this is the amount of people depending on me to get them home tonight or today. So we're, safety is, is at our absolute forefront, always. Uh, that, is, that is good to hear because everyone is, wants to make sure you stay safe. Henry would like to know, is there a junior program? I'm sorry, say that again? Henry would like to know, is there a junior program? Henry, there is not a junior program. We do have an opportunity for interns to intern with the squadron at the NOAA's Aircraft Operations Center, um, if that's what you mean. But I don't, I'm not aware of a junior program right now. And uh, Laura asks, and I think a few other people have asked when uh, around that personnel question, it looked like in that pilot in your cockpit there, you have a co-pilot? Yes. Okay, that's what folks wanted to know. Yes, I'll go back. So in this picture, um, there's kind of in broad terms, left seat and right seat. So left seat, to your point, your job is to fly the aircraft safely and you guessed it, not crash. <laughs> <laughs> the right seat job is actually oftentimes a lot more involved. He or she is working the radios, they're navigating, they're monitoring the, the engine performance, the navigation of the aircraft, they're talking with the crew, making sure that we are exactly where we are supposed to be, exactly when we're supposed to be there. Um, so they're, they're oftentimes, they're working, I'd say even harder than the person actually flying the aircraft. So a very, very dynamic a team and environment on board for sure. And uh, maybe you can answer Jackson's question at that time then. So does that mean if you have to use the bathroom that the co-pilot steps in? <laughs> Someone Correct. wants Jackson. to know. <laughs> Jackson, yes, we definitely have to use the restroom on an eight hour flight, absolutely. Um, so yes, um, oftentimes we'll have three pilots on board. So if I'm the person flying right now and I say, hey, I have to use the restroom, I'll excuse myself. I will exit the cockpit. The other co-pilot will come in and take my seat. The co-pilots are absolutely qualified and definitely more than capable to keep the aircraft safe until I return. So absolutely. But yeah, it's important to use the restroom for sure. <laughs> All right, great. We're getting a few questions about uh, things that I know you're gonna cover next. So go ahead okay. and- Awesome. So team, this is a example of a 
a standard Gulfstream 4 hurricane flight. We're taking off from Lakeland, Florida, going eastbound uh, around, was it Hurricane Jack, Nicole, is that right? It was Jake, Hurricane Jake. I apologize, Jack, if you're a Jack, you're awesome. Jake, I'm with you. So we're gonna go circumnavigate Hurricane Jake, and then we go way up here to Massachusetts, and then back down. So the question I would like to pose is, why in the world do we not just focus on the hurricane area? Why do we go up in this case to Massachusetts? Why would Noah want us to do that? So, okay, sorry, I had to get my mute off. So um, some kids, so some, one kid says, is it to check the weather? Excellent answer, check the weather, yes. So the reason why is because, let me see. Could go back to my screen. Well, how about this? While my computer is is having a moment. The reason why is because we study what's happening in the hurricane environment, because the models need to know what's going on in, in hurricane as well, but also the broader area. So if there is the weather, like you said, up there in Massachusetts, like a warm front or a cold front coming south that may impact the track or intensity of that hurricane, the models need to know what's happening there. And that's one of the specialties of the NOAA Gulfstream 4, because we uh, use the aircraft's air, um, altitude and speed advantage to cover a lot more ground more quickly. So we study what's in the hurricane environment, but also the, the surrounding area. Excellent. Here is the P3 coming in at 10,000 feet, and there's the G4 at 20 at 45,000 feet, and both aircraft are using two really good tools to understand the aircraft and provide those real-time data that the models need. Uh, the hint is over here, it is called a drop sonde. So a drop sonde is about from my shoulder to, you can't really see, sorry, to my fist, about that big and long. And it does one thing really, really well. Everyone, all hundreds of you, take a sniff. Do it again. Very good. That's what this thing does many times a second. As it free falls from the aircraft all the way down to the surface and splashes in the ocean. What, um, I'll tell you this, I'll tell you. It's uh, looking for and sensing wind speed, wind temperature, direction, dew point, humidity, things the hurricane models need to get an accurate forecast. Also, on the very back of the G4 and the P3 is something called a tail Doppler radar. That is almost like an X-ray of the hurricane. So we can see the bones of the hurricane and the structure. That's also very helpful for the hurricane models. So as the drop sound falls, it's transmitting its data to the aircraft. The crew on board makes sure it looks good, gets sent off the aircraft via satellite in near real time to the NOAA Hurricane Center to be included in, in the model runs coming up. This is the impetus for really what, what we do and why we fly. This is a product from Hurricane Dorian last August from the NOAA National Weather Service. The hurricane is right here as of Wednesday at 8 p.m. The area of white is called the cone of uncertainty. That means the hurricane model isn't quite sure where the eye of the hurricane is going to go. Not the whole hurricane, just the eye. As you can see, as you go out in time and forecast, right? Right now, the entire state of Florida is thinking, is it going to come to me? Okay? Here's a question I have. Looking at this graphic, do you think that area of uncertainty would get bigger or smaller the more times that we fly? What do you think? All right, we're getting a lot of responses in here. Um, everybody thinks that it's gonna be smaller, like that we'll know more. Outstanding, that's, that's perfectly said. It will get smaller because the hurricane forecast is getting better because the models have more information to get a better idea. That is absolutely the case and very, very good. Let me see here. I will try and share my screen. There we go. 
Now, um, uh, Grace mentioned some some excellent uh, participants from Barbados, uh, Antigua, Grand Cayman, Trinidad. Uh, the purpose of this slide is that other countries can also use and benefit from NOAA's expertise and forecasts. So as you can see, you have the Caribbean islands under hurricane watch or advisories or tropical storm uh, watches. You have Dominican Republic, Haiti, Cuba, Bahamas, right? So other countries can also use NOAA's products to amplify their own efforts to stay safe. Approaching the end team, uh, the point of this graphic is that over here on this axis is time. So focus on the number 72, that's three days, okay? And this number, this scale up here is distance in miles. In the 1970s, NOAA was off by just under 400 miles from where they thought the hurricane was gonna go to where it actually went three days in advance. Last hurricane season, much improved, we're off about 100 miles from where we thought it was gonna go to where it actually went. And this year, looking at the sub 100 mile range, okay? I'll show you a very uh, uh, a great video next that will show the view from space of a hurricane forming. I'll stop this slideshow for a second. You'll see this hurricane form in the Caribbean, and then you'll see it kind of develop and progress. Then you'll see a forecasted track of where NOAA thinks hurricane's going to go. Let's see how how NOAA did. And I'll make sure I go a little bit slower uh, so people will have have time to to, to watch it. Here we go. So here's the hurricane down there forming, getting its act together. You kind of see the eye right there forming, and there's a the hurricane track. Is that incredible? The hurricane, it just walks that track, by the way, was given three days in advance. Three days is a lot of time to prepare your families, your community, your town for an upcoming natural disaster. And that's part of NOAA's benefit, okay? We give you time. I will close on this very last slide. It's, it's a, a personal to me. Uh, this slide is powerful because I want you to focus on the expression on the mother's face and look at her situation that is in a hurricane shelter. It's not too hard to imagine that her world is being reduced to a very basic level. Questions like, will my home be there tomorrow? Where will my next meal come from? I'm hungry. Is my pet safe, right? This is where NOAA's value really shines, right? NOAA obtains the best information so the right decisions can be made. On someone's worst day, Noah is at our best. And I just want to ask that if, if you believe in our mission, you believe in what we do, please keep sharing the important work that Noah does. Even log on to NOAA, NOAAA.gov as an example. You'll see the entire suite of services that Noah provides the nation every day. I think you'd be pleasantly surprised and, and frankly amazed. So I know we're getting close on time. I'm happy to take as many questions as we can. And thank you so much for the opportunity. I, I truly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, if I could ask, Jason, we had a request from uh, Ms. Hill's class in St. Croix, um, just asking specifically about Hurricane Maria. Mm -hmm. Is there anything about your experience with that hurricane that you can share? Hurricane Maria, it, it, it rings a bell. Um, First of all, class, I think it's great that you're asking the, the question. Um, I'll put you in, in broad terms. You know, I'll, I'll repeat that we never wish for a hurricane. Um, I'll say for myself, it, it's personal, these missions that we do, because we are trying to make sure that people have the best information and the models of the best information to stay safe. So what I would uh, amplify with hurricanes like Hurricane Maria um, is that heed the warnings of the government officials, right? Uh, definitely, in my opinion, NOAA is the authoritative source for this kind of information from the NOAA National Hurricane Center. So please keep uh, updating and uh, referencing those forecasts and information because that is your source to make sure you and your families and your classes are prepared and as safe as possible. 
Thank you so much. Um, if you could tell us, remind the listeners how long you've been a pilot. Lathan I asked, been, but people other have also asked too. I have been flying for since 2006, so 14 years now. Wow, 14 years. Um, so we are hearing from a lot of teachers uh, and, uh, and, and saying how much they appreciated your time today, uh, Jason. Uh, just a reminder that we'll have some one of our mariners from the NOAA Corps, Colin Little, Commander Little, is going to be on with us on Friday, uh, doing something similar uh, for the NOAA research vessel Okeanos Explorer. And we are going to try to get Jason back for an encore performance, I think, um, because we had a lot of folks who couldn't get in today. So stay tuned for that. Check back to our website. And for your friends or family who missed today's webinar, we'll have a recording available within 24 hours. So thank you, Jason, so much for your time today on behalf of everybody. And thanks for all you do for NOAA and the nation. Hey, it, it's uh, our pleasure. I appreciate the opportunity. And thank you so much, everyone, for participating remotely. Very impressed with the questions. Uh, keep them coming and uh, looking forward to doing this again. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Jason.